Um, we, we've been in a series called Formulas. And, and before I get into it as, or you know what, let me re- go ahead and read the, the, the text. It's just a couple of verses. It says in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, it says this, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, one, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John and about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and said, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at him eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Amen. Powerful story. So we've been going through this series, and uh, this is week three. The very first week, we talked about uh, division, the the, the dangers of division, meaning the dangers of trying to live two lives. Uh, Last week, we talked about subtraction. Uh, We talked about subtracting the world out of our lives so that we can have more of God in our lives. And and today, we're going to be talking about addition. Well, what is that, addition? We're going to be talking about addition. So I'm going to give you a formula real quick. It's going to be on on the screen. It says, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And for some of us that that might have a hard time adding, like myself, we might be like, how is that even possible? What does that even mean? You know, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're just like, why did this happen to me? Amen. Amen. Sixth grade, I was copying off my friends. And every time we would get our grades back, I would, uh, for some reason, I would always get a failing grade, but they would pass. And I'm like, we have the exact same answers. And, and um, <laughs> you know, I would get a failing grade, and I'm like, no, like, something's wrong. And, and, and I don't know if it was the teacher that didn't like me. I don't know if my friends were lying to me, but they would tell me what the answer was. Like, I got so good at cheating that I knew how to cheat on the toss test, right? Dang, like some of y'all are like, wow. And he's a pastor. God can do amazing things, let me tell you. And, and, and so um, I remember the end of sixth grade, you know, my, my fear as, as a kid growing up was to fail a grade level. Well, guess what happened? Mario fell as a grade level. I get that little green little report card from Meacham Middle School, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to like 67, 68, 69, 71. Uh, I, I mean, it's just failing grades pretty much. You're probably like, man, his GPA must have been real low. But at the very bottom, the, 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 the grades didn't hit me until I read the bottom. Basically, what it was saying is you're going to have to take sixth grade again. And I was like, oh, my goodness. My friends are going to seventh grade. I'm going to stay in sixth grade. They're going to make fun of me. It was, it was a little embarrassing, right, because I didn't, I didn't know how to react. And um, nobody made fun of me. I went back to school, and I'm in sixth grade. My friends are in seventh grade. And God, the Lord, blessed me where I was able to go to another school and then catch up to my grade and graduate on time. Praise God, right? Little did I know that God was working in that. But, but I'm sharing that story is because sometimes what happens is that there's things that we do in life that are normal to us, and there's consequences. Sometimes we do things just because it seems like it's the normal thing to do. I, I wanted to play outside on my bike so I would cheat so I wouldn't have homework, and then later on I get, you know, I get flunked. And, and then what happens, it plays something in your mind when you find yourself in those situations where you're like, man, like, I, I just feel like that's just what I'm always going to be, a failure. Or I feel like that's just what I'm always going to be. I'm always going to be the person that, that people are always going to be making fun of, or I'm always going to be the one that I don't feel like I'm as successful as everybody else. But God sees different in every single one of us. He doesn't see your failures he, he doesn't see your wrongdoings. He, he sees them, but he gives you a way out. This is why Jesus plus nothing equals everything, because there's nothing that I can do. I could have passed sixth grade, and guess what? I would still be a sinner. 
I could have been the best student. I would still be a sinner. I could have graduated the top 10. And if you did, praise God. But I could have, I'm still a sinner. And a lot of times in life, what we try to do is we try to have Jesus and we try to add something else to him. And here's what the, what the, what the formula would look like. We say Jesus plus anything, add your anything in there. And what it equals is this, nothing. For some reason, for some reason, we live our lives trying to be happy, trying to be satisfied, trying to go for the next big thing. But for some reason, I feel like we always end up at nothing. Now I'm going to give you the answer, and it's not the wrong answer, and I promise you won't fail. The answer to our life, his name is Jesus. When we go to Jesus, when we seek Jesus, when we pray to Jesus, when we read about Jesus, when we talk about Jesus with our friends and family, there's something that happens in our lives. There's something that we start to experience. See, our whole life, we can spend our life trying to figure things out, but yet the answer is Jesus. I don't know if you got the point yet, but we're about Jesus here. One of our core values here is that, that our message is Jesus. Jesus is our message through worship, through our songs, through, through, through our giving, through the time of, of the sermon, through the kids going to their kids' class, from the moment that you walk in. Like, we want you to experience Jesus. Not a perfect church. Not, not, not a bunch of good people, but a bunch of saved people, knowing that there is a Savior that came for us. John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. So maybe you've never professed faith in Jesus and you're like, I, I want to know more about this Jesus. When we believe and we profess our faith in Christ, knowing that he is the only way to the Father, we have been forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future. So as we were reading about Peter and John, they're, they're walking to the temple at this time of prayer, and I don't know what their conversations are. It doesn't say, but, but I can just imagine like, hey, man, I can't believe Jesus is resurrected, man. Like, man, that's crazy. Like, we are like the ones, man. Like, we're the ones who are going to go take the gospel to people. And as, as he's talking, as they're talking together, they're, it says that he, they saw this lame man being put at the gate to go and ask for money. I don't know if after that, I like, hey, man, you want to see if this dude can walk in the name of Jesus? Let's go try. I, I don't know. I'm trying to enlighten this, okay? Because sometimes we have some good conversations when it's about Christ. We can have some. I think sometimes we think Christians like, oh, no, they're very serious. And no, like we can have some fun. We, can ha we laugh, okay? We're not weird. <laughs> like, this dude is going to church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I work at that time. This is a different time, different reasons. But you can pray in your cubicle at 3 o'clock if you'd like. So my very first point is this. is As I'm looking and I'm reading here about Peter and John, their agenda was about Jesus. And so my first point is this. We don't add Jesus to our agenda. He is our agenda. Can I tell on myself? Y'all are like, yeah, 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 come on. Oh, yeah, I like that, right? So this past Thursday, um, we had our men's walk. We're walking, we're prayer walking in River Oaks, and we're praying for the, our future home. Uh, we're praying for, for the area that God is going to move us into, which is River Oaks, and it's about four miles west from here. And I get there, and I get paired up with this, this gentleman. His name is, is, is Jesus. And I, don't wanna, I was like, should I say it? Jesus? I got paired up with Jesus. I got paired up with Jesus. And... I hadn't seen him in a while. His family, they left for a little bit, and we're walking together, and 
we're talking and he's sharing with me like, no, yeah, man, this is our trip when everything went great. And I was like, oh, yeah, what else? And man, my truck broke down. And he started just sharing a little bit more of how he was dealing with that. And I'm listening and we're walking down a block. I forgot the name of the street. And I look over and there's a guy just standing at his doorway and he's like this. And I look over and I say, hey, shoot, let's go. Let's go invite them to church. Let's go invite him to church. All right, let's go. See, my, my mind was focused on what we were talking about. I feel like it was a good thing. We, I, was, I was trying to minister to him. He was ministering to me. We we're just hearing each other out. Two brothers in Christ walking together and, and just really trying to encourage one another. And, and we get to the door of this gentleman and we start talking to him. And, and um, we're like, hey, we're just here. We're not trying to, we just want to invite you to church. Uh, oh, yeah, where's it at? And I said, we start telling, well, right now we're in the Diamond Hill area, but we're going to be moving a couple of months over here. Uh, we just wanted to just to give you a, just a little inv- invitation. And he's like, oh, yeah, cool. And his dog was barking on crazy. And then he told his dog to, to hush up. And, and, and then um, I said, hey, can we pray for you? And he's like, yeah, 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 sure, sure. And so, you know, again, this, we're, we're, I'm praying for him and we get done and we leave. And me and Jesus, get, we get back on the road and Jesus looks at me and he goes, hey, uh, I got a question. I was like, yeah, because you don't think we should have shared the gospel? And I was like, dang, he got me. <laughs> See, I, not, not that me praying for the guy was wrong, but my mind, my agenda was set on just what Jesus, what, what we were talking about. And sometimes as believers, this is what happens. We could go to a coffee shop. We could go to, to, to a certain place. And we get so excited that we're around that we don't realize that our agenda is bigger than our little circle. Our agenda is bigger than our little one-hour coffee and tea time that we have. Or just opening up. It's, it's important that we open up God's word, but it's more important when our eyes are out focusing on everybody else as well. And so I'm thinking about this, and, and, and honestly, it brought some conviction to me. It's like, I need to have some more gospel conversations. We, we talked about that last week, that sometimes we get afraid. I wasn't afraid. I was just, my agenda was focused on what I was doing in the moment, not what God was doing in that big moment. So I told Jesus, I was like, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I was trying to give him something I couldn't. And then we, we kept going. We came back. And there was a group of, like a family, they were, they were laying grass on the floor, on, the, on, the, on their yard. And I said, hey, let's, you want to go help them lay some grass? And he goes, you down to work? And I was like, yeah, man, like, I'll get dirty, let's go. So we go, we start, we go, hey, how y'all doing? Can we help y'all? And they're like, sure, if y'all want. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. And so we started grabbing grass, and we were just throwing it, and we're laying it down. I think we were doing a good job. They told us to stop at a certain point. But I hope we were doing a good job. That's, you know, I just, and, and, and then at the end, I was like, you know what? Like, God's given me another opportunity. And I said, hey, before we leave, we would love to invite you to our church, but, but it, would, it would mean a lot if I can share a message with you real quick. And I, and I walked them through the gospel, and uh, some of them, um, you know, they were like standing around me, and they had this, they, like they weren't focused on like the tree or the grass. They were looking at what I was saying. And it takes me back to this, is that when we look at people intently, not not for what you think they are, but who God says they are, you're more willing to say, hey, there's a God that loves you. There's a God that cares for you. He came and he died for you. And the sins, the emptiness that you're feeling, let me tell you, only God can can fill that emptiness. And you continue to go into the gospel. And again, sometimes people won't give their life to Jesus, but it ain't about you. It ain't about me. It's about bringing his name glory and bringing them to the people that God puts you around. And I love here in verses four, it says, Peter and John looked at him intently. And Jesus, I mean, Peter says, look at, look at us. L- look here, look at, at us. And he says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I have something, and his name is Jesus. See, sometimes we think we don't have nothing to offer. But the best thing that we can offer people is Christ, is Jesus. My second point is this. Jesus heals our condition. See, when I usually, when I would read this story, what I would do is I would focus, 
You know what I would focus on? I would actually focus on the fact that he was put at the gate to beg for money. But if you read it over and over, I even read through commentaries, meaning that it explains a little bit more of the story, and they don't even look so much at him begging for the money. They look at his condition. They keep on looking at the condition that he's in, that he was a lame man, that he couldn't walk, that, that people would take him to the gate so that he could ask for money. I don't know if you ever paid attention to those brothers and sisters that are on the streets asking for money. I can tell you where a few are, and I can tell you for those that I've prayed, sometimes you're, you're talking to them and um, you're, you're praying for them, and I've had my eyes open to just praying for them, and they're already looking at the next person that they're looking for that is going to give them something. And it becomes a little discouraging. And, and, and the reason why is because what they're doing is they're doing this daily. Like, this is their lifestyle. This is how they live. This is how, how they, they bring in money for themselves, to buy a beer, to buy some food, whatever it is. Or, or some of them, it is an actual need that they need some money for them to get a room or to get to the next town. But, but what I've noticed is that they'll, they'll look at you and they'll ask you, and the moment they feel like you're about to just pray for them, they're like, oh, let, let, me, let me see who else I can get. Maybe that's why some of us, whenever we get to that place, we're like looking for our phone or we're like acting like we're texting, right? Because the moment you lock eyes, you're like, oh, like I'm, I have to commit. I have to commit. What if next time we commit, we're like, hey, look, I'm sorry. I don't have money to give you. But what I do have is the name of Jesus. What, what if the next time the people are honking at you to move out of the way, not because you're, you're giving somebody five or 10 or $20, but because you're praying for them. What would that look like? But I would say is this, is that I believe that sometimes we can be like this lame man. And I think sometimes what happens is this. We judge people according to their habits, not their condition. What, what I'm trying to say is this, is that sometimes there's things that we are doing that we know are not good. There, there's a, for instance, every time I go home, I just drink a beer because I need to relax. That, that's just a habit that I have. But there's probably a condition that's in your heart that's causing you to do that. It, it's a habit for me to just yell at my kids when they get loud. Maybe you're angry about something that you need some healing from. It's just normal that when I don't get any, I'm going to go look at pornography. Hey, it's just the real thing. I, it's, just, it's just a habit that I drink a little too much and I end up in somebody else's bed. Maybe there's some condition in your heart that we are not allowing Jesus to heal. Maybe there's a condition in our heart. See, a lot of times we, we want to fix the habit, but we don't want to fix the condition. We want to fix one, two, three steps. Pastor, just give me three steps of how I need to surrender to Jesus. And, and, and let me give me some habits because I need something so that I can fix myself. Well, the way you fix yourself is by starting with Christ. You know, I, I've been watching a lot of YouTube and, and I've been getting a lot of ideas on how to be more productive. I can get 10 steps, I can get 20 steps, I can get two steps. But if I don't see the value in my time, if my heart is not postured to say every single moment that I have, I have to bring on God glory, I'm going to waste it on the things that I want. See, the habit is this is why we get on our Instagram, this is why we get on other things, because it's a habit. We want to waste our time to please ourselves. But there's something that, that moves in you when you're looking at these things. And so what happens is in this moment, we, we, we start, the condition is like, man, I'm not, I'm worthless. Man, I'm not worthy of this. Man, you know what? God wouldn't love somebody like me. Why would God want to use somebody like me? I'm messed up. Like, you don't understand. Like, some of us, we might even say, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get through life. I, I just got to step up the ladder and get better and, and make more money. But there's a condition of why you're doing that. I'm just a workaholic. No, you're trying to get away from some stuff. So what ends up happening is that in that moment, when we have this mentality, it ends, 
It leads us to accepting any kind of donation. Any kind of donation. Like, I want you to think about this. This lame man, daily, he, he would probably pick up his arms and they would pick him up and they would go and drop him off at the gate. And then guess what? At the end of the day, they would pick him up, take him back home and drop him back off. The next day, same thing and get dropped off over and over and over. I think for some of us, that's how we are. We, we've created a habit because we're used. We're, we're used to telling ourselves, that's just what my life is all about. God, God, you know what? Like, this is all God gave me. I can't. How is God going to use this? And our mentality, what it does is it, it robs us of what God is trying to do in our lives, what God is trying to do in our finances, what God is trying to do in our relationships, what God is trying to do in our marriage. Are you getting the point? What, what God is trying to do in our work. Put in work God is trying to do that you probably aren't missing it. You're missing it because you keep going back to, well, this is just a normal thing. See, he, he got so used to this that he already knew Juan and Pedro were going to pick him up to go drop him off at the gate. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that sometimes we're so used to even the people that are around us. Like, that's just how we live. That's just how we do things. That's just my people. That, that's just, and guess what? You think you're being helped, but in reality, you're just getting dropped off and dumped there. I, I know that the story doesn't say that, but, but I'm imagining like, like the people that were in this condition were not able to go into the temple because there was a Levitical law that basically said that they were unclean. And so can you just imagine how some people, hey, well, you're unclean. Sometimes people, they don't want to touch them. And, and I think sometimes we have the people in our lives and we think that they're helping us because it looks like we're moving forward in life. But for some reason, I keep ending up in the same place. And so we settle for less than what God has for us. But I want you to look at verse 7 and 8. It says, then Peter took the lame man. Look at that. It doesn't say the beggar. It doesn't talk about, it doesn't talk about his habit of him reaching out his hand and, and getting money and reaching out his hand and getting money every time somebody passed by. It says, they took the lame man. They didn't take the beggar. They took the lame man. They, they took the person that had a condition and, and, and by the right hand, helped him up. And as, the, as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. What I want to tell you, church, is this, is that, that when we do not realize that our condition is that we are broken sinners in need of a Savior, what happens is we minimize what God can do with us. But the moment we're like, hey, God's going to do the work. I'm going to trust him. Can you imagine this man with a condition for 40 years since birth? And all of a sudden, these two dudes come up to him and say, hey, I got something better than, than money. I got Jesus. Give me your hand. Get up and walk. What I'm trying to tell you is that when we surrender our lives to Jesus, the blessings in our life, is it comes through the healing that he brings in our lives. It comes for us being, so I'm going to surrender to what he's asking. I'm going to do, the miracle is not me. It's him doing it through me. That, that condition that you have for the last 15, 20 years, what, what happened here? He jumped. He stood up. He was strengthened. He walked. He leaped. He praised God. This is what our lives can look like when we say God is the only answer. It is Jesus who will heal my condition. It is only him that does the miracle. And maybe in your brokenness, maybe in your weakness, maybe in your confusion, maybe in that lifestyle that you know doesn't glorify God, when we give it to him, he's the one who will give you the strength. He's the one who, who will set your path straight. He's the one who will give you peace in your life. Because he is the answer to every, listen to this, and you might not like this. He is the answer to every life problem that we have. He is. My wife and I have sit at our table and we've talked to people, to couples, individuals, our friends. 
and, and people have sat at the table with us. Or my wife and I, my wife and I have sat at other people's table where they've spoken the same thing as like, man, we have these issues. We gotta fix this. I don't know why this is going on. My marriage is falling apart. And it's like, maybe it's because you need Jesus. That's not what I wanted to hear. That's not what I wanted. What I wanted is I wanted you to fix my marriage. And how is Jesus going to come from heaven down to earth? Oh, he already did that. But when we realize that me picking up my socks, me not leaving a mess after I trim my beard, me me trying to uh, just do laundry, those are good habits. Those will help your marriage. Trust me. But what will heal your marriage is Jesus. Jesus holds everything together. It says in in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, it says this. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see, the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdom, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church. He is our head. He is our leader, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's why Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Because if you have not professed faith in Christ, if you have not believed in what Jesus has done, if you have not confessed that Jesus is Lord, you have nothing. But when we put our faith in him and say, man, he is the only answer, we have everything. Colossians 3.3 says, for you died to this life, And your real life, listen to that. The real life that you're looking for, the real life that I'm looking for, it's only found in Christ. That is the only one we can find our meaning and our purpose, our significance. I mean, probably those words all mean the same thing, but you get my point. That that, that is the only, you want to be a better person? You can't. But you can be a healed person through Christ. The last part of this is Acts chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. I want you to think about it. Peter and John see him. Come on, get up. Let's go. He walks into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. Heard him praising God. To some people, I bet he probably looked crazy. But he knew what he had. He knew what he experienced. Have you ever done that in your truck? Just praise God? Ah! Not, it sounds like I'm yelling at God, right? But, you know, I don't have a voice like everybody else. Ah. But then we come here on Sundays like, oh, Jesus in the name. Man, what if we just came in together and it's just like, man, Jesus is king. He is Lord. Man, we love him. Praise him. And I'm trying to remember some of the songs we sang, but their lyrics aren't coming up. But, but we started singing that as one. I'm telling you, like, when we sing together, I mean, it's like a big celebration. Because each and every single one of us have this condition, and yet there's a Jesus that loves us, and he's worthy of every word that we bring him glory, and we say, man, you have healed me, and I know that I came to the right place because there's other people that are messed up like me, but yet they're forgiven, and they've been saved, and I want to just bring glory to his name. So they saw him and heard him. It says, when they realized, when they realized He was the lame beggar. Remember, it's the condition. They had seen, they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Let me tell you, there's some friends that you hang around with. There's people that you have influence that I would never meet, but I'll probably meet them when you bring them with you on Sundays or to our Bible studies or to our wave groups, to our small groups, to any events. But let me tell you, they're not going to be, oh, yeah, Pastor Mario is up there. No, they say, man, I remember when you used to be that drunk life of the party, bro. 
I, I remember, I remember who you are. I, I'm telling you because that's what they would tell me. Bro, I can't believe you go to church. There's no way. Like you used to be the one that would be the first drunk out of everybody. Lightweight. Some of y'all got it. Some of y'all got it. Y'all party animals got it. But, but, but that was the thing is that people saw me as that, but I saw myself different because I knew whose I was. And there's people that are around you that, that they might not know that you're here right now, but the moment that you hear that you go to waves of faith and you're serving and, and you're tithing and you're giving, you're like, man, it's all about Jesus. They'll be like, there's no way. There, there's no way. Say, like, yeah, his name is Jesus. It says, they all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. I love that last part. Here's my last point. You need me, I need you, and we both need Jesus. You need me, I need you, and we both need Jesus. We are a body that meets on Sunday at 1030 in Diamond Hill. Ordinary people, regular. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says that, that the people saw them and they saw the disciples and they were like, these are just ordinary men. They're just these ordinary, uneducated, common men. They don't have no diploma. They have no degree. They have no gold or silver. But what they do have is Jesus. That's what makes us extraordinary, church. Because we can either settle for what we're used to settling for, where our mentality takes us, or we can find a Peter and a John in our lives that we say, we're going to hold on tight. Because I need you, you need me, and we both need Jesus. The beautiful thing is that if you keep reading in this story, Peter doesn't say, hey, look what we did. He says, no, look what Jesus has done. And then thousands are coming. Thousands are coming. Thousands are coming. Just giving their life to Christ. Because they realize, you know what? I've been trying to fix my habits, my rituals, my, my daily routines. And honestly, I, I, I still feel empty. realize when, when, when Jesus heals my condition, I live my life different. I, I see people different. So here's your homework. Remember, we said every week we're going to have homework in this series. Simple. They walk to the temple at three o'clock. What time do you need to add to your daily life so you can meet with Jesus? Who are those that you need to add into your circle? You know, one of the things that there's a habit, another habit, okay, I'm gonna give you another one, is when you buy something, you have to get rid of something. Because if not, guess what? It starts becoming like just, what is it, a hoarder? You become a hoarder in that. So if you buy two shirts, you get rid of two shirts. If you buy two underwears, you get rid of two underwears, okay? Buy two shoes, you get rid of two shoes. You, you do that. So when you add some friends, when you add people to your circle, there's going to be some people you're going to have to, hey, right now is not the season for us to have this relationship. Not because I don't love you. Not because it's just that right now, my life is about Jesus. And through that, I believe that God will, will bring some healing in their life because they'll see, man, if God can heal you, if he's really the answer, I, I want to know more. I've experienced this firsthand. I see people that are in here that I went to school with that I was like, man, I'm excited for one day to come to Ways of Faith. And you're sitting in here. Amen. Not because of me. I want to point you. It, it's because of Jesus. It's all about 
And so as we sing today, as I, I give you everything, I, I, my heart is open. That's the only way you can really, truly receive Christ is we open up a heart and say, you know what? Like, do what you have to do. Take out what you have to throw out. Because I'm going to trust you in it. Your relationships will grow. Your marriage will become healthier. Your finances. I mean, just everything you will see the blessing because God's hand is truly over it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. God, thank you for your peace. Thank you for your healing. And I know for some of us in this room, it's, it's a hard moment. It's a hard moment because there's some things that we really want to hold on to. Our formula really does read Jesus plus anything. And today, God, I ask that our formula changes. That is Jesus plus nothing. You become our everything. Strengthen us. We're believing for miracles in our marriages. We're believing for miracles in our relationships. We're believing for miracles in our own lives. That we truly see who's the miracle worker. And your name is Jesus. Your name is Lord. Yahweh, Jehovah. Hmm. Father, I ask that you be with those in this room today, with us that are daily going back into the daily routines because it's easier to do that than to surrender to you. It's easier to, to, to find ourselves in the same condition than to allow you to heal it. So God, I ask in the name of Jesus, whatever brokenness there is in this room, whatever confusion there is in this room, Father, those that are seeking things that are not you, Father, those that, that their lifestyle just seems so confused, God. For those that have been hurt and holding on to for many years, deep wounds, traumas that they've gone through, Father, I believe, Father, I believe that you can heal them. And so I pray with faith that people out of this room walk out healed. That people out of this room, they, they walk with confidence. That people out of this room, that they praise your name. That people out of this room, that they can leap for joy. That they can walk with their head high knowing that you have forgiven them of their sins. But that they take the most important step today. And it's to surrender their life to you. It's to believe that, that you came and you died you were put on a cross, a criminal's death, what we all deserve, but yet you stood in the gap and because the blood that was shed was the atonement, was the payment for my sin, for our sin. And when we believe that Jesus was put in the tomb and three days later he rose again, he defeated death and our sins are forgiven. He has conquered death. We believe that. We believe that. I pray for those in this room that will make that decision today or that will make a decision when they realize that they really need you more than anything. Father, we love you and we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask all these things.